Again, thank you so much for joining and good afternoon. My name is Rakia Ramsey. I am the director here at the Women's Legislators Lobby with WAND. Um, really excited to bring to you our event today um, with a really good friend of mine, Rachel Rizzo. Um, for you all, just wanna let you know that Will here is um, here to actually bring these events and these presentations to you as part of our effort to educate you on current and timely national security events, um, as well as they also um, connect to um, different campaigns that we have going on and, and our fights um, it was in Congress, as well as um, our policy fights on the Hill. So, um, Today's webinar is brought to you because we are in the thrust of our Pentagon budget campaign. And we understand that there are a lot of calls in Congress. Um, actually, even before Russia invaded Ukraine, there were calls from Congress to increase the Pentagon budget yet again. Um, and this year, President Biden is actually calling for the largest um, request for the Pentagon in history at $813 billion. And so today's uh, webinar is our effort to kind of give you some background historically and currently on the effort in Ukraine. Um, so that if you have any questions around that and what's going on, we would be able to address those in today's chat or follow up later. Um, so that, you know, like I said, as we're pushing for and we're calling for Congress to actually reduce the Pentagon campaign and reduce the requests that they're putting out this year, that we have an understanding for um, you know, what is actually going on in Ukraine, if there is any pushback on the need to have this big increase and the need to have this money. So I don't wanna to speak too much about, because <laughs> um, I don't wanna get into what Rachel might talk about, but um, just a brief introduction on Rachel. Um, Rachel is Rachel Rizzo is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. Her research focuses on European security, NATO, and the transatlantic relationship. Prior to joining the Atlantic Council, Rachel was uh, the director of programs over at Truman Center for National Policy and Truman National Security Project, where she managed a team of senior fellows and oversaw all Truman branded publications, program and policy initiatives, and where I had the opportunity to work with her uh, briefly there. Uh, she also spent a year as a Robert Bosch fellow in Berlin, Germany, and over five years at the Center for New American Security uh, where she co-authored several reports, including The Defining Moment, The Future of the Transatlantic Security Relationship. Her writing has appeared in numerous publications, including Politico, Foreign Policy, Defense One, National Interest, War Politics, Review, and The War on the Rocks. And she's a frequent commentator on European security, providing analysis for The New York Times, Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, CNN, NPR, and a host, a host of others. So without further ado, I will leave it to you, Rachel, to talk about Ukraine, the situation that's going on, and give us some context here and some background. Absolutely. Well, Rakia, thanks so much. It's nice to be with you on Zoom again. We'd spent like a year doing this together during COVID at Truman. So it's, you know, it's like old times. Um, but it's it's really nice to be here and to talk about a subject that is the focus of a lot of my research. It's near and dear to my heart. Um, I've focused on European security, NATO, Russia for a really long time. And so I always feel um, really privileged to get to share this information uh, with people who might not spend the waking hours of their lives uh, reading about NATO and, and what's going on uh, on the ground in Ukraine. And so I think I think the most helpful thing I can do here is offer a little bit of historical context. I think how we got here and why we are here gets lost in the uh, 24 hour news cycle. And there's a lot of information that is out there that's kind of hard to parse through. Um, there's been reactions from the United States, from European leaders that are uh, swift and unified and 
Um, it's a changing situation every day on the ground. Um, it's, it's, it's a continuous war. I don't see this wrapping up anytime soon, unfortunately, which means the effects of this war are gonna be felt by the West, I think for quite some time. And, um, and so I think putting all this together with some context for, for folks can be, can be pretty helpful. And so that's what I'll do. Um, if, as I'm speaking, if anyone has something that they want me to pause on, to extrapolate on, to expand on, please just ping me, put it in the chat here. I'll be monitoring it. I want this to be a conversation. And so um, feel free to just stop me as I go, if you'd like. And if not, I will wait until, uh, I'll, I'll also have time at the end to do a Q and A session. So with that, I will go ahead and get started. I don't have any slides, so I'm just gonna go ahead and give you what I got and, and we'll go from there. Um, so going back to February 24th, which was the day that Russia invaded Ukraine, um, we watched for months ahead of that time, a buildup of the Russian military in Russia's Western military district. Hundreds of thousands of troops slowly amassing on the Ukrainian border and warnings from the West, from NATO leader uh, Jens Stoltenberg, from Joe Biden, um, leaders in Europe, that an invasion was imminent. And Putin, of course, deflected and said, "This is this is not this is not going to happen. You're overreacting as you normally do. You're trying to create a situation that will give us a reason to invade. That is not our goal. Um, as we all know." That is not <clears throat> what ended up transpiring. I think it's helpful to remember that this is not the first time Russia has illegally invaded its neighbor. The last was in 2014 with the illegal annexation of Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula, uh, and the continuous underground support that Russia has offered uh, separatist factions in the eastern Donbas region of the country. So we already have contested spaces on the map that have set us up for this, uh, this invasion. I think one major difference that we're seeing between 2014 and 2022 is the type of warfare that Russia is waging. 2014 was all about the hybrid little green men um, uh, without Russia insignia on their, on their clothing. Um, Russia did not take, um, take credit for any, uh, any of these people sowing discord on the Crimean Peninsula. When you compare that to what's happening today, which is a full-on invasion, it, it looks very different. Um, basically what ended up happening in February, in the days leading up to February 24th, we saw Vladimir Putin officially recognize the two separatist republics in the Donbas region, the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic, and said that Russia was going to send in peacekeepers to the region to help, again, keep the peace. Of course, that was just an, an, uh, uh, a false flag uh, for, to, to lay the groundwork for an invasion. And then, of course, just a day or two later, we saw as tanks started rolling across the U Ukrainian border. Now, fast forward to today, we're about a little over 50 days, if I'm not mistaken, into this invasion. And Putin has had to fundamentally change his, his strategy. Um, I think a lot of people thought that this would be a quick war, that the Ukrainian military would be quickly overcome by the sheer power of the Russian military, this, the sheer force of materiel that it employ, employs, the number of conscripts that it has, um, and that's just, and that's not what we've seen. Um, and I think Putin has been surprised at what has transpired in, in Ukraine. Um, I think if he had his way and, and the way that he was planning on this going is this was going to be a quick war, um, not enough time for there to be real public opinion shifting around it. And as we've seen happen over the last six or seven weeks, that's just not what happened. I think he overestimated the strength of the Russian military. 
This is what happens when you have a personalized autocratic regime who gets sold a false bill of goods constantly by his advisors because he's surrounded by yes men. Um, I think he underestimated the Ukrainian military, which has shown great bravery in the face of um, Russian advances, but at the same time, didn't have to contend with the type of warfare that we thought Russia might employ, which was, um, you know, for example, they didn't achieve air superiority priority in the first uh, opening salvo of the war because it didn't think that it needed to. And this really gave Ukraine time to get its positions in place, get support from the West and really put up um, a pretty big fight. I think Putin also underestimated the solidarity that he saw or that has he's seen amongst Western allies. Europe and the United States have implemented far-reaching sanctions against the Russian state. This includes um, kicking multiple banks out of the international SWIFT system, which, as you know, facilitates financial transactions internationally and which without the SWIFT system, they can't uh, settle payments between, between two sides. Um, they've sanctioned the Russian central bank, which has in turn created a, a situation where the ruble is basically, it was in free fall, it's, it's come up a little bit, but it's still expected that the Russian economy is going to experience severe economic contractions over the coming year. Um, we've seen sanctions on uh, multiple Russian oligarchs, members of the Russian Duma, which is their parliament, members of the Russian Duma's family. I mean, these are very far reaching. And then finally today, another sanctions package from the US Treasury talking about um, sanctioning another commercial bank as well as Bitcoin miners in, in Russia. Uh, in Europe, there is a lot of questions about whether or not the Europeans that are still heavily reliant on Russian energy are going to embargo uh, Russian oil. Um, I don't think that we're in a place where Russian gas, gas is gonna be embargoed, um, but we're already seeing a situation where prices are starting to rise because the energy um, uh, market is starting to constrict due to a lack of supply. And so, Europeans and Americans actually are already dealing with this in a pretty severe way. Um, Putin has also <laughs> pushed Finland and Sweden into uh, outside of their uh, historical stance of military neutrality. These two countries have always been members, well, not always, have been members of uh, the European Union since I think it was 1995, but have refused up until now to join NATO, uh, but as we've seen the security situation change, so has public opinion changed in these two countries very swiftly and significantly over the last six or seven weeks. And it's expected that these two countries are going to officially put in their application for NATO membership in the coming weeks, not months. So that's something to look out for. Um, the Germans, of course, have uh, canceled a major pipeline that was finished, although gas wasn't flowing yet, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that was set to send Russian natural gas straight from Russia under the Baltic Sea to Germany. Uh, this has been a major headache for the Biden administration. Uh, Republicans were holding up a lot of Biden's ambassadorial nominees because they wanted the US to sanction this pipeline and we were refusing to do it. So that took care of a big problem for us now that that, one, uh, that pipeline is not on the table anymore. Um, and there's increased Discussion, of course, about um, force presence on NATO's eastern flank, what it looks like to have military presence, uh, increased military presence in countries like the Baltics, you know, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania. So all of these questions that um, were sort of being punted around over the last couple of years um, are really being thought of much more seriously nowadays. And a lot of this can, uh, can be attributed to the fact that Russia decided to invade its neighbor and um, uh, uh, continues to do so. A lot of the questions I think people ask right now is why? Why now? Why Ukraine? Um, 
I think what it comes down to, there, there's a few things. This is not a monocausal event. This is uh, a whole array of issues that have come together to create this situation. The first is obviously that Russia does not see Ukraine as a real country. Uh, Putin looks at this as reconstituting part of the Soviet Union, the dissolution of which he views as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Um, uh, sorry, 21st century. And he um, he looks as though he looks at Ukraine as though he is uh, correcting a historical ill. Um, and and NATO, um, you know, you there's a lot of discussion amongst a lot of people about a tacit promise that NATO leaders gave to both Ukraine and Georgia at a NATO summit in 2008 saying that those two countries would eventually be part of the alliance. And of course, we all know that has never come to pass, but it's always sort of hung over their heads, right? We gave them the, the worst end of the stick. We said that you'll eventually join. We're not going to tell you when. And what that does simultaneously is uh, angers Putin, you know, continues to poke the bear. And, and that's why he says that NATO membership is a part of what's happening today. I don't think NATO is the main actor, as I like to say, but it plays a supporting role here. So <clears throat> questions about where what's happening now, where we're going to go from here. As I mentioned before, Putin has shifted his strategies uh, and is focusing more heavily on the eastern region now after the initial forays into Kiev didn't end up the way he wanted them to. So they sort of pulled out of the Kiev region and are reconstituting forces along the um, in the Donbas region in the east. Simultaneously, the West is now bringing out the big guns, um, no pun intended, I, I mean this literally, we're sending them uh, more artillery, uh, more heavy weaponry, uh, the, Slo the Slovaks, for example, have sent the um, S-300 surface to air missile system, we're seeing the West support Ukraine today in a way that it hadn't up until now, and I think we're about to see a very conventional style war for the Donbass region in Ukraine with heavy weapons, artillery, and the like. Um, this is going to get worse before it gets better. I don't think that there's any possibility of a negotiated settlement at the moment. If you've listened to Zelensky speak almost daily on this issue, there is no option for him on the table in which he will voluntarily give up Ukrainian territory. And so I think we are seeing a point where um, this is going to go on longer than anyone expected. And so we have to get ready to do this for the long haul. I think what this means for the United States, there is a few things. Um, public opinion, there's a couple things here. Um, I think in the aftermath of the initial invasion, we saw public opinion really start to shift in favor of more support for the Ukrainians. This is evidenced by the fact that there were multiple polls of Americans showing that like a vast majority of them supported a no fly zone over Ukraine. Now, of course, a no fly zone can't just be established. It has to be enforced. And this means that um, many Americans were in favor of the enforcement of a no fly zone, meaning that NATO countries would have to shoot down Russian planes that were in violation of the no-fly zone and potentially fly into Russian territory and destroy um, uh, uh, missile systems in, in the country. And so my question is how many, how many people that were in favor that, of that actually know what goes into en enforcing a no-fly zone, but I found that public polling pretty interesting. Um, and so when it comes to um, you know, members of state legislatures, members of US Congress, we're really going to have to figure out a way as this war grinds on, as we see increased numbers of refugees, both in the United States and in Europe, um, the call for the United States and the West to do more, as I like to say, um, and, and really kind of think through what doing more might look like um, without, as Biden says, causing World War III. Um, we're also going to have to, I think, balance uh, higher prices for food and energy, like we're already seeing, as, as 
people have explained many times, um, Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world. This is a, a heavy producer of, for example, wheat. We're already seeing food shortages in different countries in Africa. Um, I think we're going to start seeing more supply chain issues, which in turn will increase prices on, on goods. And we're all already seeing the energy market start to constrict, which in turn will uh, raise prices on the energy market as well. And so this is something that I think people in the United States are going to have to contend with in the long term. Um, Biden has already released some of the strategic petroleum reserves, which I think is great, but this is a shorter to medium term solution. We're really going to have to think through what this looks like in the long term. And then as far as what this means for defense, I mean, look, I think what we're going to see out of this crisis is sort of two, two camps of people emerge here. There's one camp of foreign policy policymakers and professionals who have always been um, advocates for a rebalance to the Indo-Pacific region, the acknowledgement and recognition that China and the broader Indo-Pacific region is the most strategically important region for the United States, and China it continues to be the pacing threat for us, and we need to plan our defense spending um, accordingly. There's also a camp of people that have and, and have begun to emerge from this crisis that sort of take the opposite approach that have said, we told you that Russia has always been an issue. Russia uh, has the ability to spoil a lot of our plans. We need to send more U.S. troops to Europe and not just on a rotational basis. We need to send them there permanently. We need to um, we need to increase defense spending and uh, to an incredible amount so that we can face two front, a, a potential two front war um, and really start to have more ground presence in Europe. Um, I don't think. I don't think that's right. I think that um, the tendency for the United States, as, as people like to say, when all you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Um, when you are heavily reliant on military power and militarism in general, I think it's easy to think the answer to these difficult questions is, well, we're going to spend more militarily because that's how we buy things like uh, and, and invest in things like AI, quantum, uh, hypersonics uh, to compete with Russia and China. That's how we're going to modernize the nuclear triad. A ton of questions come into this. Um, but I, I think that we should try to resist the the uh, the call for just a phenomenal increase in military spending. I understand why it had to happen this year, um, but I think there's going to be a big push for a lot of people for this to just increase and increase and increase. I think the right strategic approach is probably in the middle of those two realities that I described to you. I think this is a real opportunity for the United States to deepen our economic ties with the European Union and um, increase cooperation on that front while simultaneously supporting the Europeans as they attempt to uh, build up their own defense industrial base, spend more on defense, and uh, become more self-reliant and responsible for their own continent and their general neighborhood. Um, I think we're gonna see a situation where we uh, probably sell a lot of weapons to the frontline states, the Baltics and Poland, and potentially turn them into garrison states. Um, and, and, I, and I do think that if it means the United States has a lesser chance of getting pulled into another war, we should support a strategy that looks like that. Um, so this is a ton of information, I, I know, but if anyone has any questions, even if it, if if even if it's off topic or or you think that it might not be relevant, um, or if um, I mean really anything, please ask and I'm I'm happy to answer the best that I can or find the answer if if I need to. So Rakia, I guess I'll hand it over to you. That was a great overview. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I really appreciate you giving the the, the background um, as well as hitting on what state legislatures can do in terms of, <laughs> I love that too, um, when everything looks like a nail. Um, and all you have is a hammer. All you have is a hammer, like yes. A um, I lost my train of thought. Um, yes, I'm really, I'm really glad that you hit on what state legislators can do in terms of, or how this will affect state economies, because we are seeing, right, um, rises in energy prices, rising food, um, 
and so I, I, I have a question of my own, but I want to leave it for others if they have a question. I'm going to pull back for a second. Sure. Um, I guess while folks are thinking, um, oh, there's a hand. Yes, I'll go ahead and unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, um, the area in the U in the Ukraine that they are there in the eastern that they're going to start to fight over. My understanding is that that area uh, is like coal country, or but instead they have gas, and that some of this fight is really about that, about Putin's desire to take over that area or its gas reserves. I mean, that is that is an aspect of it. Um, I mean, he this is part of the industrial heartland, of course. And so that does play a role. Um, but I do think that, you know, when you look at the map of Ukraine, it's, you know, divided by the Dnipro River. And the, the East has always, I think he's always had his sights on, if not the entirety of Ukraine, at least the Eastern part of it. Um, and he's felt like he already has some support there because of pro-Russian separatists in that region. Um, and so it's almost been an easier target for him. I also think that the fact that there are, um, there's, a, there's two things I would say here. He wants to, um, he would love to create a land bridge from Crimea to Russia, which means taking over some of the ports uh, on the Black Sea. That's, I, I think, a, a, a more a broader goal of the Russian military. Um, more broadly, though, the fact that these are port cities and would cut Ukraine off from shipments coming from the Black Sea. I mean, this is part of it, too. So, yeah, yeah. destroying the, the overall industrial capacity of Ukraine is definitely a, a part of the strategy here. Um, but I do think that when it comes to the broader goal, it's the fact that he believes that uh, Ukraine isn't a real country and he wants to unite the Russian people. I mean, this is really what he believes and this is the approach that he's taking in order to do that. Thanks. But one more thing about ports, I will say on the Black Sea, I think we're going to see a situation. I mean, um, a bunch of NATO countries, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, they all are uh, Black Sea countries, Turkey, of course. And so when it comes to how NATO countries are reacting long term to this invasion, I do think that we're going to see a lot of these countries beef up their Black Sea presence, which um, I mean, there's there's some laws that are in place that limit the tonnage uh, of, of, of certain ships in the region. And so those come into play. Uh, but the Black Sea region, I think, is going to become something that is much more worth watching now than it was uh, a few months ago. Great, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Thank you, Rep Gable. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? I want to also say too, um, which I didn't address at the top, we're going to have to cut today's webinar a bit short so that we can let Rachel run off to another engagement. Um, so we will be ending at 450. So Here's a question in the Q&A about hmm. what state legislators could and should and shouldn't do when it comes to Ukraine. I would say, um, from, from my point of view, it seems it seems like this um, this has sort of passed a little bit, but I would encourage people to resist the calls for the enforcement of a no fly zone. Um, I I think that the I, I, like I mentioned, I think that the argument for that is somewhat past. But we saw in the early days of the war, you know, when you're watching indiscriminate bombing on uh, on towns and civilians. I think there is a real desire and, and 
a tendency to want to do something. And I don't think that a no fly zone is, is the right approach because I, I, I do think that it can bring more destruction to civilians and um, you know, private industry and property than, than would otherwise happen. And so I would re resist calls for that. Um, I also think refugee support is going to be, be really important. I don't have numbers yet on the number of refugees the United States has taken from Ukraine or is planning on taken, taking, um, but public support for refugees, not just from Ukraine, I will add, I mean, this is still a major uh, issue on, on the docket with, with Afghans too. And, and so this is, I think, a broader conversation that we can have about um, the United States uh, welcoming refugees at the state and local level. Um, and then, I mean, I'm not an expert on uh, state legislatures, but I, I mean, I would actually be interested to see how people respond to increased uh, food and energy prices. And, um, you know, something that we've heard from Biden, I think over the last year is, and I don't know how this plays at the local level. Um, I would actually be interested to see, to, to get people's thoughts on this. But, you know, if you listen to Biden speak, um, he really views democracy versus autocracy as the existential struggle of our time. And, you know, the support we provide Ukraine, who's on the front lines of democracy, the pain that we might need to feel economically to support Ukraine is all in service of this broader goal of making sure that democracies deliver for the people. Um, and, and so I don't know if that's a line that plays at the local level if, or if people are like, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but like I went to Trader Joe's last week and spent like, you know, 30% more than I would have. And it cost $120 to fill up my car. Like, yeah, democracy is important, but I can't afford this. Um, so I, I don't know how to balance that locally, um, but I think it's gonna be something that we have to talk about and figure out. Um, I just want to, so we can share to, um, in here in a second, we've, we've put together um, a document that we can share for you. Um, for the for the audience uh, members of, about what state legislators can do to support. And we've mentioned that, yes, um, helping to take in Ukrainian refugees. The other thing is that states have actually done various different things. Um, I think it's in Florida where um, the governor has like stopped state taxes on energy, for example. Um, so there are ways that I've noticed states, you know, try to, try to grapple with the economic situation. The other way that I've seen um, sort of support, um, even though I think there's some legal issues around this, like whether or not states can actually, you know, legally carry this out because it's, it's a matter for the federal government, not really for state government, but in terms of, you know, sanctioning um, Russia businesses or um, divesting really from Russia businesses. Yeah. I know here in North Carolina, Governor Cooper um, put out an executive order asking the North Carolina businesses to look at, you know, the business that they have with Russia and, and, and try to wind that down. So in that, um, thank you for sharing that, Sam. In that, yeah. um, you know, obviously there are jobs perhaps tied to these businesses. Um, so I think I think it, it really matters on what would what you can do politically in your state um, and and maybe taking a look at uh, around to see sort of what that might mean, you know, economically, what what actually can you do to, to help alleviate either the economic impact or if you're a state that, you know, might be trying to look at divesting um, from from Russian businesses, what does that mean and, and how would that sort of impact you economically? Is there anybody on the call that might actually be in a state that that might be doing this or oh, okay something in the chat oh. I have to pause there okay mm -hmm. yeah i've been seeing that um in a couple of states florida is i think the first one i, I recognized any other questions while we've we still have a few minutes oh yes Representative Gable? I, I hope I'm it. saying that correctly. You are. You okay, are. great. Um, we, we did pass a, a bill about um, the war in the Ukraine. One of the things we put in this bill was um, 
that the pension funds and retirement system established under the Illinois Pension Code to divest their holdings in any companies that are domiciled in Russia or Belarus and that are on the list of restricted companies developed by the Illinois Investment Policy Board. That's helpful. So we also had the cities of Bloomington and Normal to renounce their sister city relationship with oh, wow. Vladimir, Russia. What was the sister city? Uh, with Vladimir, Russia. Okay. Bloomington, Bloomington uh, Illinois. Okay, that's helpful. City of Chicago to renounce its sisterhood relationship with Moscow. And a few others, Dixon to renounce its sister city relationship with Dixon, Russia. And uh, those are the a few. And then uh, just encourage Illinois to accept um, Ukrainian refugees. Mm -hmm. And then we, yeah. And then we set up a money laundering and real estate task force to uh, be able to look at the possibility of of Russians money laundering here in Illinois and how we can address that. That's helpful. So just wanted to share, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this fantastic thank examples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of pausing in gas taxes. Yeah, this is good information, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Yeah, that's great. All righty. Well, the question I was going to ask um, was about drawdown um, weapons um, because it's just a general question. Um, you know, we keep hearing these announcements for more weapons and more support. And so I just wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, what happens when, when Biden um, allows for a drawdown of weapons and we send that, you know, those those weapons over to Ukraine? What does that mean in terms of replenishing? Um, and then obviously the impact on the budget. Well, anytime we send weapons abroad, we have to replenish the supply, right? Which gets to the defense industrial base. Um, and so I don't know, for example, um, off the top of my head, like how many howitzers the United States has in our, um, in our arsenal, um, and how many we're sending to them. But this is, I mean, this is really the big issue for the, for the U Europeans, right? Because a lot of them have American kit. And so there was this whole, I'm, I'm sure people on this call, um, maybe you were following this, although probably not closely, there was this plan that the polls hatched. They were like, well, we're going to send our old Soviet MiG fighter jets to Russia and the US is gonna replenish our supply with F-16s. And, but we're gonna do it by <laughs> sending the MiGs to Ramstein Air Base, which is a US air base in Germany. And like the Ukrainians are gonna come and pick them up. So basically it would look like the, the Americans are sending fighter jets to the, to the Ukrainians. And Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor was like, uh, yeah, we're not, we're not doing that. Um, so it's a way that I think some Europeans have been like, well, if we send Ukrainians our old stuff, then the Americans will replenish it. But we have we have issues. We have replenishment issues, too. Same with the Germans. They were they were there was a big talk about Germans potentially sending tanks to the Ukrainians. And then the German chancellor came out and was like, uh, we actually can't send them without not being able to defend our own territory. So sorry, we don't have we don't have the supply. So. I mean, I think for the United States, uh, you know, a, a defense industry person is probably better suited to talk about what this actually means. Uh, but this is going to lead to an increase in, um, you know, in industry investment and uh, uh, replenishment of our supply. Yeah, I was starting to see um, talks from some, you know, defense hawks in Congress, um, basically asking for a larger number than the 813 because of this, what you were saying, because of the need to replenish what we've sent to Ukraine. Um, I'll give one last call for questions before we wrap up so we can be on time here. Yeah. And if anyone wants to reach out offline, of course, um, I can put my 
email in the chat and just feel free to, if you ever want to shoot me a message or email or anything, just let me know. Um, That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Rachel. This was great. Um, fantastic anyway. overview, high sure. calorie, as John used to say, <laughs> um, and, and, yeah. and really great um, backgrounds. I really appreciate that. A lot of great examples from the States on what you yeah. all can do in terms of you know, handling um, or trying to trying to mitigate some of the economic impact in your states and also support um, Ukraine um, in other ways in terms of divestment um, and, and different things that the states are doing. So really appreciate that. This recording will be available on our website to all of our members. So this will be behind the portal. Um, and I also want to circle back to the Pentagon budget campaign. Um, was stumbling a little bit in there in the beginning and, and bumbling around because this is actually an awkward time, I think, to be rolling out this campaign. Um, but that is why we wanted to make sure that we also provided other resources for you along with that, um, which we can send um, around to you all to make sure that you have that. And so what we have available is a Pentagon audit one pager. So it just kind of talks about um, the background in um, what's required in the Pentagon audit, the fact that it has failed, you know, that audit um, four different times and just gives you some, some background there. We also have um, Sam shared with you what you all can do um, in Ukraine. We have a one pager there, some other examples of what states can do and you have, um, or what states have done already. And then you have the examples that were shared here today. So we appreciate that. Um, and then we've also, for those of you all who have signed or are in a position to um, kind of, you know, get your colleagues, um, as, you know, to sign on to the letter, we have a dear colleague letter that you can share. Um, to encourage others to sign on to that letter as well. So this is the Pentagon budget letter that's going to Congress, asking them to reduce the Biden request for this year with the understanding that uh, what is going on in Ukraine is very um, serious and we definitely wanna support Ukraine in any way that we can, but we also understand that there, there are other um, resources available for Ukraine, and we are, are also supporting Ukraine and have been through military and humanitarian aid. So that is all. I can let you go five minutes early. I um, want to thank you all again for, for your time. Thank you again, Rachel, for, yeah. for joining us. Um, and it was great to see you. You too. Great to see you. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you all. See you later. Okay. Bye.